What's up, YouTube? We're back with the third complete herptological panel forum. Today, my guests talk all about advancing husbandry in this hobby that we really love. And to be honest with you, this was probably my favorite panel that I've had so far. I learned so much from some real, genuine experts who had a lot to say on the topic. So this is definitely one you're gonna wanna watch the whole thing. I know it's an hour and a half. If you gotta, wait till I send out the clips and break it up in a little bit. But there's little bits that don't make it into each clip, so it's nice to watch the whole thing. If you wanna check out some of my older videos, you can click a link to those here. In this video, I'm gonna share links with you in the description of some websites that were talked about during the video. So keep an eye out for those as well. I really need a favor from you guys. If you like this channel, please like, subscribe, and even share the video because it really helps get the word out there about what we're trying to do. But it's just take care of the reptiles that we love. So this video talks about it all. It talks about enclosure sizes, it talks about bioactive, diversity in diet, it talks about outdoor cages, and breaking reptile rules that we know about, and busting myths, right? So there's a lot of really valuable information in this video and you're gonna want to check it out so stick through to the end if you have to maybe put it on in the background while you're driving on a long trip or, or work and put it in your headphones or something like that it's all good because you can really just listen to it as well as you can watch it so that being said I'm not gonna take up any more of your time the video is long enough as it is enjoy but welcome everyone to the third Herp Panel Forum. I'm excited to be here. I hope you guys are excited as well. We have some amazing panelists today. We have Trace Harden from Harden Herp Delogica. Uh, you can check him out at hardenherp.com. Mariah Healy, reptile husbandry specialist and consultant from reptophiles.com. Highly suggest checking out that page for care guides on many commonly kept species. And last but certainly not least, we have Riley Jimison of Riley's Reptiles, also a host of the Reptile Room podcast, co-host of the newly released Colubrid Corner podcast, and helps out with Morelia Python Radio whenever he's needed. Uh, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm really thrilled that you guys could all be here today, and I want to dive into that. So aside from that intro, tell us a little bit about yourself, what animals you keep, uh, sort of where your experience lies, and what got you interested in keeping reptiles and other animals in the first place. So we'll start with you, Trace. So I have been working with animals for about two decades now. I got my first uh, like exotic pet store job at 14 and was hooked ever since. Spent all of my 20s, like a decade working at the uh, Omaha Zoo. I worked in the um, butterfly and insect pavilion for half of it, the amphibian conservation area, which took me all around the world to do conservation projects, uh, and amphibian projects in Honduras and Panama. Um, Let's see, and then of course, reptile and amphibia, reptile crew. Uh, right now I work for the Department of Agriculture as an entomologist, so I'm a risk analyst. And I've traveled, last six years I've traveled all over the United States, working in different states for different uh, parts of uh, pest exclusion and uh, just working, I have a master's in entomology and it's a, it's a really nice balance between insects and reptiles. So it's like when I was at the zoo, I had tons of cool insects and stuff at home. And now that I'm working with insects, I have tons of cool reptiles at home. So it, it kind of switches back and forth. But those are my primary interests. So um, other than that, as far as what I keep, let's see, mostly Brazilian rainbow boas uh, and a lot of Colombian rainbow boas. I've got some uh, jungle carpet pythons, uh, lots of Sumatran uh, uh, short tails, uh, blood pythons. Um, yeah, a few different Marilia. We've got like Bradley eye. And I just picked up uh, uh, 20 Candoya pulse and I, so it'll be the first time working with uh, the little uh, Pacific Island boas, the little Candoya. So I'm pretty excited to work with those. I don't know if you guys have any experience. I'd love to pick your brain about getting babies to feed. So um, yeah, and then just tons of hodgepodge stuff. You know, I've got a, a living room tank full of Kaiser newts and uh, tons of tarantulas and, you know, just kind of ebbs and flows of different things. I mentioned earlier, um, when we were all chatting, I'm getting ready to build a facility. So I'm excited to move everything out of the house and into a, into a building with, uh, yeah, more display cages and stuff like that. So I'm super pumped. So. Ah, terrific. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're happy to have you. So Riley, go ahead. Why don't you uh, introduce yourself next? Um, yeah, so I, uh, I got my start in reptiles as a, as a little kid and got my first California king snake at like nine years old and the rest kind of just took off and have been keeping I, throughout my childhood I kept reptiles off and on and we had all sorts of animals and then in college I really sort of took off with it 
um, and then uh, started volunteering at the zoo and then that took off into a, an actual career as a, a reptile keeper in, in AZA institutions for about seven years before leaving zoos to uh, pursue a new current uh, collection manager position here locally at, um, at a breeding facility and um, yeah I've just been keeping reptiles my whole life and breeding for the last six or seven years and um, I keep a lot of different things uh, mostly carpet pythons uh, some rainbow boas Madagascar giant hognose snakes um, black tail crebos I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot more, but yeah, a few odds and ends here and there. So yeah, and uh, tarantulas, scorpions, you name it. So I've seen kinda... the scorpions a lot lately on, on uh, YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. Yeah, yeah. So I had a, a female Arizona striped tail give birth to 58 babies a couple weeks <laughs> ago. So Whoa. I've had my hands full with that. And uh, but yeah, no, I, I what's that? Well, I'm sorry. What's striped tail? Are those what? It, are those vihovis or what is? Yeah, the, yeah. Oh, very cool. Man, I didn't know they had that many babies. That's crazy. I, I didn't either, dude. She's wow. like, she's like an inch long, and she wow. had 54 babies. They're all like maybe the quarter the size of a grain of rice when they were on her. Yeah, like almost indistinguishable, other than the dots for the eyes, and then they came off. And honestly, I was nervous to give them fruit flies. They were that small, but no problem. So. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. So I, you know, like you have kind of a little bit of everything. I have an eclectic taste as well. Everything from collie bridge to boas, pythons, inverts, and uh, I just can't get enough. Yeah, for sure. Well, welcome. And Mariah, tell us about yourself. So I have had reptiles in my life on and off for about as long as I can remember. Um, when I was real small, uh, my family had little like those quarter sized red eared sliders before they became illegal. And then my first lizard was a green anole when I was seven or eight. I had a couple of those for a few years. And then I went back to turtles uh, for a couple of years after that uh, when I dove back in. And then uh, in college, I got my first uh, bearded dragons. And that was what actually got me into reptophiles. Uh, I'd always been researching and I loved researching animal husbandry, but uh, it was the bearded dragons that finally uh, was the tip of the iceberg, I guess, for me, the tipping point. Well, tell us a little bit more about reptophiles if you could. Oh yeah. So reptophiles is um, a basically, it's a reptile husbandry database that I'm building out slowly but surely. Um, my goal is to provide a place where people can read about modern, up-to-date, progressive reptile husbandry practices rather than the same old, same old that's been practiced for the last two decades. We've learned a lot in the last few decades that the reptile ho hobby has really started to grow, but uh, in the middle of that, there's also been a lot of information that's gotten mixed up in the internet is a great blessing, but it's also uh, a bit of a hindrance when it comes to helping people find good information. And not everybody knows how to do that. So that's why I created Reptophiles, to just kind of compile things, uh, the good facts from the best sources that I can find and put it in an easy to read format for new keepers and more experienced ones as well. Terrific. But, uh, yeah, I sorry. keep, sorry, <laughs> uh, sticking with what I have experience in. Um, directly keeping, I try to keep it varied. So I have a ball python, a, a boa imperator, a Central American boa, a small colony of oscillated skinks. I've got an Maruki Indonesian blue tongue skink, a Northern Australian blue tongue skink. Let's see, a Sudan plated lizard, a uh, recent acquisition, a Euromastix Jerry, or Gary. I have no idea how that's pronounced. No one and does. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the case with scientific names? Uh -huh. And then I've got a crested gecko and a mossy leaf-tailed gecko, and then a colony of about 14 morning geckos last I checked. <laughs> oh, very cool. <laughs> yeah, right morning on. geckos are delightful, but they make the count a little difficult. Yeah, they'll do that. 
I'm going to just throw out a few relatively common sayings, some total myths, uh, some have some merit, um, but just sort of tell me what you think. So the first one for you, Mariah, reptiles don't have feelings or emotions. They're simple-minded animals, and as long as their basic needs are met, they're thriving. Mm. Yeah, I uh, recently wrote a blog post on this at the beginning of the year about uh, anthropomorphism in the hobby and its uh, positives and negatives. It's, it's something we really don't know much about, which is really interesting. A couple of years ago, I would have said, no, they don't have emotions, they don't have feelings, they don't think on the same level as humans do. Absolutely not, it doesn't matter, they're not intelligent. They're just base creatures, and, but the intelligence does vary, you know, from species to species. Now, it's just gotten muddier. Um, I think they do feel on a certain level. Uh, certainly, it's not likely to be as complex as with humans or even uh, animals such as dogs or horses um, or possibly even birds. Uh, it seems that intelligence seem, is probably correlated with a social nature, but uh, that I'm not an expert on that. Um, Lori Torini actually recently mentioned in one of her, I think it was her interview with the Animals at Home podcast, that snakes have a form of, um, do, it's not, I feel like she said oxytocin, some kind of love hormone that I wasn't expecting or um, more than just your average dopamine pathway, saying that they've got this capacity, so there's more in their little brain than we think so, than we think. And uh, when you've got people saying, well, jumping spiders have one neuron, but look at all, what they can do, a friend of mine is doing his PhD on them, it makes you wonder. So I like to approach it as assume that they're more intelligent and sentient uh, than the average, which is not, and treat them accordingly. Awesome. Uh, Trace, you were nodding your head a lot. What do you, what would you like oh, to add to that? Yeah, I, t I totally agree. I mean, I, I definitely think you hit the nail on the head, Mariah, when you said uh, it all depends on species. And I think that, yeah, some species are um, a lot more intelligent and probably that has more to do with like their food chain and, and what they're doing. You know, I, I think mm -hmm. like a little fossorial earth snake might not have as much sentience as uh, like a Kribo or something like that. You know, some like vision, highly acute, you know, sensory organism that's going to chase down prey and, you know, like monitors that problem solve, you know, parenti and stuff like that. But um, uh, yeah, I, I, I totally, yeah, I, I just totally get everything you're saying, so. That's tremendous. Uh, Riley, anything to add? The only thing that I would add, because everything up to this point has been perfect, and I agree with all of the above as well, and couldn't have said it better, is that the the way I sort of gauge it is, like, if you have a, a, a litter of boas or a clutch of pythons or snakes or whatever, within an entire litter, so they're all genetically relatively related or the same, um, you'll get different personalities and that has to speak to something because you can have calm snakes, you can have confident snakes, you can have um, snakes that are really impacted by their first couple experiences and some that are just so confident they just, you know, end up being very uh, viable, healthy animals. And I think that has to lend to something further that we are not comprehending yet. So I think they definitely have something more going on upstairs that we don't give them credit for. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. Uh, Trace, let me ask you, or let me throw this at you. There's no such thing as too big of an enclosure. Gosh, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. That's, a, that's uh, from a logistics standpoint, that seems very difficult. You know, like you can have a very large enclosure, but, you know, logistically, if you're just keeping a little Western hog nose, you know, does he need or he or she need that much space, you know, like, but, you know, a walk-in exhibit or something. So, no, I think logistically, you probably, there's no such thing as too big of an enclosure. Is that, that is that how we're saying? Yeah, we're saying it's too exactly. big, right? Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, at the, some, at the same time, you know, we all also breed animals too. And we know that sometimes little baby snakes, as we know, are, may not thrive in huge exhibits and we definitely can't keep those uh temperature when they're so fragile temperature and humidity parameters perfectly in tune in a big exhibit you know some if you put a little removal in a 75 gallon tank as a baby 
kind of like, uh, you know, like I'd recommend something a little bit smaller, like they kind of like that confined space, you can keep a better eye on uh, humidity and temperature a lot easier and watch feeding. Um, but no, I mean, like for the most part, for an animal that's going to utilize every inch, you know, a big beaded lizard or something like that, sure, like you can, you can do a very large exhibit, just, um, you know, just make sure it's getting checked on every day and it's getting food as necessary. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Does anyone have anything to argue with that? Well, to use a uh, commonly used phrase, uh, it's not the size, but what you do with it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think there is definitely a minimum for keeping each species and our understanding of what minimum is, is always expanding. And that's not the topic we're talking about, so I won't go into it. But I think you can truly have an enclosure of any, you know, you could put, say, a Western hognose snake in a bedroom-sized exhibit. Now, what the big problem there is, is exactly what you said, Trace, it's logistics. It's how do you make sure that you get all of the right husbandry parameters in there? What I really like about a larger enclosure, however, is that you get so much more diversity. You can have a bigger temperature gradient, you can have a bigger photo gradient, you can have different types of substrate for them to explore, you can give them some things to climb, like you really give them much more diversity and environmental enrichment, the more space that you give. And as I've been learning how to design reptile enclosures, I have really found that space is one of the biggest considerations that I have to keep in mind. Because like, okay, here's what I have, here's what I need to achieve. And then I find myself going, huh, you know, this is still above the, the recommended minimum size for the species, but there's so much I want to do and so much that I want to provide for them that I wish I had a little bit more. So I really do think it's more about how you use it, but obviously it's not practical for everybody to, you know, keep a bearded dragon in a bedroom. Would that be awesome? Totally. But is it practical? Mm, probably not. And especially not for, you know, breeders and Re getting really young reptiles off to a good start in nature is just okay you know survival of the fittest go and figure it out but as a breeder those are investments so you really have to do everything you can especially in those critical first few months of life to give them the best chance awesome uh yeah Riley anything to add into that yeah I mean I don't think there's necessarily too big there's impractically too large but you know, I've had beaded lizards in walking enclosures and watched them swim in the pool and climb up the rock work above my head. So um, the only challenge is, is, you know, bigger enclosures means bigger investment in heat, insulation, water, furniture, whatever it is to keep it appropriate to hit those parameters. It can be done, though. If that's your goal, it can be done. Just be prepared to really, like, put in some serious effort before you get the animal in because you're going to have to dial it in. Now, that being said, with babies, if I were to take a hatchling carpet python and put it in a, you know, a six foot enclosure, four foot tall, or something, it would like lose its mind. It would be terrified. It would not eat, you know, like I would really have to fill that with tons of clutter. And even then it probably would still freak out. And I've got animals that once established, I've upgraded them appropriately. And as soon as I do, they, they go off food and they freak out and I put them back in the way too small enclosure and they go right back to like doing all right. So it, it does depend on the individual, but otherwise I don't think you can necessarily go too big. Out of awesome. curiosity, Riley, uh, if yeah. I may interject, no. uh, how long of an acclimation period do you give them when you put them in their adult enclosure and you've noticed that they freak out? How long do you give them before you give up? Uh, usually five to six weeks or so, sometimes more. I just, if it's a, if it's an animal that has good body condition, I'll happily wait it out longer and try different hides or double check things. Or, uh, I've got some perch options that I can, you know, kind of move around and things. I've changed substrate up, but there's just certain animals and it doesn't happen often, but that girl in particular is uber uber shy like she does not like to be seen she doesn't like to be exposed at all uh, when you take her out she squeezes as hard as possible into a tiny little ball she's just very nervous um, the rest of the animals you know at a certain point once they're eating they could you know certainly upgrade and do fine it's just every once in a while I get one or two 
um, individuals that seems to just lack that confidence to the point where the slightest little changes and upgrades, they lose their mind. Mm, interesting. Yeah, my uh, ball python, I rearranged her enclosure, did a full strip down. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to say it was near the beginning of this year. And it took her several months to start acting. Yeah. Again. It was ridiculous. Unfortunately, she had good body condition. And now, as you saw earlier, she's doing yeah. phenomenal. But I do wonder, I think I know the snake you're talking about. And I, I wonder if she'd be a really good candidate for uh, Lori's training or not the yeah, Lori's training process or the Reptelligence training program. It would be super interesting if you ever wanted to try that. Yeah, it would be cool to see because she's so pretty. I would love to have her be confident and out, but she is like, she, she's a probably two foot, you know, carpet python and she prefers to cram herself in a hide about this big, you know, three mm -hmm. inches cube. Mm -hmm. And, and she, she'll take food at night if I put it in there and I'll see her out on top of it at night. But if I open up uh, her enclosure or slide her out or anything, she's like, nope, don't, don't look at me. Yeah, she hides her head like a ball python too. It's kind of silly. So uh, thank you. A couple things from the chat. Uh, Lori Torini, who, who we've mentioned a couple times, is actually watching with us today. And she mentioned uh, when we were talking about the brain structure, uh, there's a awesome article. And obviously, we're not going to read that right now. But um, I'll put a link to that in the YouTube video. And I'll also share it on the, on the Facebook page because that um, is going to detail uh, the vertebrate brain structure there for, for snakes, which is, is terrific. Thanks for sharing that, Lori. And she had said, one of the smoothest ways I found to acclimate snakes to new enclosures is to put their entire previous tub or whatever they were living in inside the new enclosure to allow them to come and go as they please and habituate in their own time, uh, which is a terrific. Thank you. Uh, thanks for adding that, Lori. And, and I think that makes a ton of sense. Riley, we'll stay with you uh, with the next myth that we hear a lot of times. Reptiles will grow to fit their cage. <laughs> Oh, that's so bad. Um, yeah, no, that's definitely not true. Um, reptiles and most animals in general, based on their DNA, have a predetermined set of maximum and minimum achievable size with appropriate conditions, nutrients, you know, all the factors that go into thriving and, and surviving. And you can push those boundaries a little bit uh, under ideal conditions, but um, shoving a seven foot, you know, a potentially seven foot water monitor in a 15 quart tub is not going to keep it the size of a hatchling mm -hmm. because that thing's going to outgrow it in four weeks, even if you, you know, feed it as little as it's going to outgrow it. So, um, I don't, I don't even know of a single animal that does that. I think a couple fish might do that, but otherwise that, that is, yeah, that's a bad one. Yeah. yeah. Any, Anyone want to refute that? No. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Even goldfish will outgrow their bowl if given enough time. They they're slow oh, growers, yeah. but yeah. like, oh, yeah. they're coy. At the end of the day, they're coy. Yep. Do you guys, do any of you remember the very old website, bonsaikitten.com? Like, so yeah. long ago, yeah. like early internet days, but it was a fake website and someone like, yeah, raise their kitten, it was completely fake, in a bonsai glass jar. And it was an instructional video of how to raise a kitten to make uh, an always kitten. It was totally fake, but it was like one of the first like memes of the internet, you know, uh -huh. bonsai. Kitty. I remember it. Uh, yeah. Very old school. So yeah, no, it doesn't really work. <laughs> like, <That's fine. laughs> but I do kind of uh, like, we're kind of bouncing around this idea. And I, since I have some experts, I wanted to bounce a quick question off of you guys. Um, talking about, uh, maximum size like i'm moving a bunch of tortoises i keep tortoises too like four red foots and a, a couple um uh, burmese brown mountain tortoises and i have them now in a very large backyard pen but i can see them all the time they have burrows and everything and i can always check on them i'm getting ready to move to three acres and i want to like let them go and let them have it's the access to like a creek and stuff like that obviously i can't let them completely go but like you know, kind of bouncing around this idea of like, how much space is too much space to where you lose your tortoise? And like, how do you mitigate, you know, you want to give them enough space, but you want to be able to keep an eye on it. Like, that's what I'm playing with before I start building fencing and stuff, I guess. Um, like, I don't like, do you guys have any crazy? Because I'm like, I'm really spitballing ideas here. But have you guys seen like, the little tile pucks? I know nothing about this. But like, could you glue that to their shell? Would that have any ill, like, deleterious effects so that you could track them at all times? You know, like, hmm. 
you know, like, like, is, or is that crazy? Is that a bad idea? Can you guys, because I mean, I know we do stuff like that in conservation, so I don't see why you couldn't do a little radio tag. Um, yeah, I think it would be more practical to use a microchip because gluing something to the shell, if it doesn't damage the shell, it will eventually get shed off with one of the suits. Yeah. So a microchip yeah. is probably your best bet, like attached to an app on your phone. You can just go out and like, just I don't know. douse Does that one exist? of them, I guess. Are the, uh, so I know there's like, you can microchip and you can read and identify them through microchipping, mm -hmm. you know, like surgical implantation. But mm -hmm. you, like, does the ability to like, like what a tile has, like you find your phone feature, does that yeah. have, does that exist in a microchip form? Um, I've seen know. it on the born identity. Yeah. And so. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, so, I mean, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm an entomologist and I'm working a lot on this giant Asian hornet. And one of the things we're trying to do is we're looking to capture live worker hornets. And these hornets are like hummingbird size. They're huge. Uh, you may have seen them on the news. They're newly invasive up in Washington. And so the plan is capture live uh, hornet workers. We could actually fit a little um, like radio antenna to as a backpack on them. And they've done this with other species of hornets in other countries. And that female hornet will go back to her hive. And then we can like radio telemetry and follow her to her hive and then eradicate the hive since it's a very dangerous invasive species. So that's why I'm kind of thinking like, can I just do that with my tortoises? And like, you know, I, I totally agree, Mariah. I know that that tile will shed off, but you know, if I daily check on them and watch them on my phone, I can, you know, I can, I'll kind of know if it falls off. If it falls off, I'm in trouble. So like yeah. if I start seeing it get loose, you know, but I don't want to inhibit their growth either. So I don't know, these mm -hmm. are kind of, have you guys ever thought of anything or done anything like that at the zoo or anything? Right. I really thing. feel like that's a good question for a wildlife researcher. I mean, you basically are, so I, I think it's, try it. <laughs> try it's it. gotta Let be possible. How it works. Yeah. yeah. With with wildlife researchers, there's a that that small percentage chance that their animals could get lost or they don't find them or they yeah. get taken by predators, and that is a very real thing. Um, so depending on, you know, the native wildlife in your area, you might want to, you know, consider whatever yeah. sort of perimeter you might need to keep them out. And if that's not practical on, you know, too large of a scale, then scale it down to find out a practical way. And then all it, it's about just containment and having a system of checking them daily. Yeah. Um, having a, a night, you know, sort of shelter area in case temperatures get too cold, somewhere, you know, where they can regularly be seen, maybe a feeding opportunity so they know to come to this area, but they're going to graze all day. So you could get right. pretty creative and inventive. You could, you know, you could pick Lori's brain and teach them a recall, you know, do it on a triangle, go out there like 10 times. Yeah. It'll take them a while, you know, but you could seriously do that or like oh, a they're, color. They're trained now. <laughs> oh yeah. Put yeah. a color stake, you know, tortoises have very good color vision. Yeah. Um, you know, so you could, you could really get creative with that, but it just depends on your time, you know, how often you're going to be there. Do you have the ability to keep, you know, an eye on them? can you throw cameras out there it's a you know you can get as creative as you want but just know the bigger you go the more work it requires yeah true and that's what i want to avoid i want more tortoises less work and happier tortoises so like how do i get that balance you mm -hmm. know yeah great question and that's i think an excellent segue to my next question um and so trace and maybe is is that the kind of the the most ambitious thing you've seen i want to see like what have you guys seen or done yourself that you would say is like i don't want to say the craziest but maybe the most ambitious or the most experimental sort of trick with husbandry or, or in your care either in zoo or personal whatever you've done um and then i'll, so, I'll open that up to all of you guys too but we'll start with trace again yeah, I mean, I, I think that I, I have, I don't think I've, I've not done any mad experiments or anything like that. So, um, but, you know, I think working with a lot of the endangered species at the zoo is really fun, particularly invertebrates. So uh, I love herps and I work with tons of endangered species of uh, reptiles and amphibians, but like invertebrate um, endangered species are neat. There's a species of uh, tiger beetle that's critically endangered. There's only, I think, at one time there were 30 individuals left in the wild. They're found in uh, eastern Nebraska. 
in a salt marsh, um, salt creek tiger beetle is what it's called. Uh, salt marsh was drained uh, to build Lincoln. And so there's a few like remnant habitats. So uh, it became an endangered species. The zoo, we bred them at the zoo and um, the larva of the tiger beetle are like a little fossorial trapdoor larva that are one of the fastest moving organisms in the planet. Like they move so fast when they catch prey and pull it back into their uh, layer to eat. Uh, it's you can't even see it. So we had, and like one of the biggest problems we had is the uh, adult tiger beetles. We had to get fish and wildlife permits to collect 15.15, brought them into captivity. We could only keep them for two weeks, let them oviposit their eggs, and we had to re-release them back in the wild. So we produced hundreds of larvae. Uh, and one of the first years we noticed that it was uh, cannibalism was so bad because they were, they would dig burrows, but then they would dig burrows to their neighbor's burrow and come up. So we had to realize like, okay, well, this is the first time we've ever bred this species and captivity they like to eat each other how do we do you know what do we yeah. do now you know so we we went to a system of like test tubes and like using test tubes of soil so then we would actually it's a really great uh it was really fun to do it's, it took hours and like tons of volunteers <laughs> we take a paintbrush and like sit over a petri dish full of these little tiny micro larvae with a paintbrush and like tease them out, like wiggling this paintbrush over and they grab onto the paintbrush and then you put them into a test tube. We did that for hundreds and hundreds. And, and then we eventually we started re-releasing back in the wild. It's a huge success story, the Salt Creek Tiger Beetle out of the Omaha Zoo. Um, and so like, yeah, stuff like that, just trying to problem solve. Uh, we didn't like that they were in soil. So we tried to like, cause you couldn't see them and monitor them. You could see, you know, their cap. So we tried to use, have you guys ever seen those uh, ant farms that are like gelatin ant sure. farms? We try to do like, well, let's try to keep them in jello, you know, like, you know, ant farm gelatin. And that worked well, but, you know, it's just, I, I think we all are just kind of like problem solvers. And we, I, I like getting new species. I mentioned earlier, I just picked up 20 uh, little Solomon Island or Pacific Island boas, Kendoya, Pulse, and I. I've never worked with them. So I'm really excited to try and crack their code and figure out, you know, how I'm going to get all these like tiny little boas to eat, you know, like, so yeah, stuff like that is I guess, I don't know, that, that kind of answers the question. I think Absolutely. I just took you on a nice walk. <laughs> so. I, I loved it. Uh, no, how about you? Uh, no, that was awesome, Trace. Those beetles are the, what are they, the tiger beetles you said? Yeah, the Salt Creek tiger beetle. Um, yeah, they're, they're neat. It's a Sibilla. Fascinating. Uh, what about you, Mariah? Uh, first, Trace, I gotta say, I'm super excited with you about the Kandoya because I think Kandoya are wonderful and yeah. I would love to add one to my collection one day. So really looking forward to hear about what you discover about them. All right, wish me luck. Right. If you come across any good husbandry stuff in reptophiles, please let me know. So uh, I'll see what I can find, but it's, uh, as you know, not easy to find info on that species. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Let's see, to answer the question, uh, I don't do too much crazy stuff myself either. Um, I guess right now my current project is trying to get live plants to thrive in, uh, in vivariums and it's not easy. Uh, they, I'm on round three of live plants in my Northern Blue Tongue Skinks enclosure simply because the temperatures that I have to achieve in this environment and the amount of light and just finding out what plants are going to be able to tolerate the sheer amount of light and heat that this species requires and without having to resort to things like aloe. So latest project is, okay, let's get some festuca grass in there. Let's get a jade plant in there. So kind of getting into succulent territory a little bit, but really uh, testing what can be done even in the hot and the dry, because I love the benefits that are offered by live plants. So that's my personal experiment. One of the craziest things that I've heard being done is uh, what Sam Perrette is doing with designing like super custom lighting that replicates every single little bit of change in daylight over the course of a day. Mm -hmm. It's nuts. If you guys have heard anything about this, what he's been doing, like, so his I haven't, no. specialty is in programming and electronics. So he's been literally, I think he's been using a Raspberry Pi to literally program something that will mimic a day cycle in a certain part of the world. And then like different colors of lights, like not just how much light, but the intensity of the light, the color of the light, like how much UV is being provided, how much infrared is, like temperatures, the whole shebang, recreating nature and the amount of wires and probes and 
computerness that's going on. I can't even wrap my mind around it, but he's having fun and I'm just looking forward to seeing it progress. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I wondered about that uh, myself, so I'm glad that someone's following up on that. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Riley, how about you? So crazy stuff, like it, interesting outside of the box thinking. Yeah, is that exactly. that's sort of the gist? Yeah, exactly. Something new. Um, I mean, I cohab my Madagascar giant hognose snake. <gasps> yeah. Um, are we gonna have this discussion? <laughs> Well, no, because I got a live baby out of it. You know, one out of three eggs survived. Three of five eggs were good. And the adults all tong feed for me in there, and they're all great. So there's no need to, to argue this because <laughs> the success is right uh, to my upper left here. And uh, anybody who has grievances can file them to uh, RileyAjimison at gmail.com, <laughs> and I'll promptly delete it. Um, but no, so I, I cohab that species because it, it seems to suit them better. I saw behavior change when they were, uh, I quarantined uh, a pair together and then, um, cause they came in from the same source and they did great. And then when I separated them, they became more high strung and, uh, their feeding habits were sporadic and they're just filthy, too active. Like they seem way stressed. I put them together in a big enclosure, a bunch of bedding, leaves multiple hides a big water dish and all of a sudden i have new different animals now they don't like being handled they're you know urate and feces flingers but you know if i leave them alone they're fantastic and they are very observant and curious animals so i break a, a number of rules there and i'm proud to say it and then uh at work uh we just finished a, a massive enclosure that uh now currently holds uh, seven adult sailfin dragons, two or three monkey tail skinks, and five Indian star tortoises. And it's like, you know, small bedroom size walk in sort of a deal with a hundred gallon pool, waterfall, the whole awesome. The oh, whole dang. nine. Yeah. So we just got it finished today. It needs a couple more limbs. And I want to give the tortoises a few like ground shelter areas that aren't just like cork and stuff. Um, but I want to build more of a canopy for the monkey tails to, to break away from the fins. But there's this beautiful ledge um, overlooking the waterfall. We've got a fake log that swings down with bark texture in it that's all stamped in so the sail fins can really get good grip. So we're breaking a lot of rules there. But the, the thought process is that, you know, these three animals occupy a similar climate within their regions. It's not too far away from one another. It's not that far of a stretch of the imagination. And the tortoises are on the ground, so none of the animals bother them. The monkey tails just kind of hang out on a piece of wood somewhere. And then the sailfins just kind of spastically run around all over the place and bask and swim. And everybody just gets along. So That's awesome. And, and I think nice. reptile keeping is the example that proves the rule, right? That um, I don't know what I'm leading up to. All rules are meant to be broken. Right. And I think reptile keeping is, is one of the hobbies that really proves that. Uh, and I would um, not just recommend uh, someone who doesn't own reptiles and is getting right into it. Just say, oh, great. I'll break all the rules then. Um, right. It should also be pointed out that you guys know what the heck you're doing. So long as is that's the, the foundation, I think we can experiment with with recreating wild conditions and, and taking minor, minor risks quite safely. Um, so thank you. And then, yes. Yeah. And, and, May and I add? Go, please. Yeah. To expand on that, I'm not against cohabitation at all. I am against naive cohabitation, like you were saying, yes. Stephen. It's, you don't want a new keeper jumping into these advanced techniques just because they saw somebody on YouTube who did it successfully. That's not how this works. You really have to know the animals. You really have to know the species and you need a fair amount of experience behind you so that if it goes south, you know exactly what to look for and to separate immediately, and you know the signs of how it works, because what works for one species is obviously not going to work for another. What uh, works for your snakes, Riley? Like, great, they're showing good signs, but like, just because two bearded dragons are living in the same enclosure, like same 40-gallon tank without having killed each other yet, that's like, uh, <laughs> it's one of those things. So really knowing the species, 
being an expert, it, there's definitely a scale of husbandry, like from the absolute bare bones basics to the super advanced crazy. And we need to respect that scale and just go with what we're comfortable with so that we can respect the learning curve, but keep the animals safe as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well um, said. I, I'll add on that and I completely support that because it definitely needs to be thought out and it could go drastically wrong. I've had it go wrong um, when everything was good for a while and then all of a sudden it just wasn't. Um, in Santa Barbara, we had an outdoor exhibit with three or four California desert tortoises and some chuck wallas and it was 2.5 chuck wallas and the two males were great forever and it was a massive enclosure like huge i'd have to run around this thing to catch lizards in the winter to get them away and um and one day they just weren't okay with each other and it resulted in a serious fight and wounding and infection and loss of an arm for a chuck wall and yeah. that was that and there there was no rhyme or reason it just went south um so yeah even under the best circumstances with tons of space things can still go wrong. Um, although at work, we do have 2.3 bearded dragons in a massive enclosure right now, um, and they get along okay. And, you know, we're keeping an eye on the, the subordinate and the dominant males, but he really doesn't go over and bully him. He doesn't black beard. He doesn't head Bobby. There's no competition for food because we feed separately and do a few other tricks and things. And there's a lot of visual barriers and I kind of treat it like an alligator enclosure, put a lot of visual barriers in there. So the boys don't fight and uh, so far so good, but that's not to say it can't go wrong. So I think, you know, for somebody who's looking to keep animals uh, as family members, as pets at home, you know, you definitely should really think about it before you consider cohabitating animals. For that's, sure. that's that's a funny, really Riley. Interesting approach. I was like, when you were saying visual barriers, I was like, yeah, like an alligator enclosure. And then you said it, I was yeah. like, yeah. yeah, that's that's zoo, that's like that's zoo feel, man. Like that's yeah. hilarious. Just <laughs> there's there's clutter, there's logs, there's yeah. things all over the place. So not appealing to if us. If you get down at their level and you sit in one corner, you can you know like you can't see everybody from that vantage point, and it just you know there's little tricks and things. But again, it probably only really works because these two males somehow are not as combative as they could be right it's all personality right yeah again personality there are significant what mm -hmm. go ahead yep oh i was just you know there are significantly aggressive beardies and then there's some that are just placid so yeah true and they do have a spectrum of social behaviors that we've mm -hmm. been able to observe so they do know a little bit with how of how to get along with members of their own species and that is learned in you know the first few months of life that's one of the reasons why the breeders i've talked to actually prefer to keep the babies together is learn mm -hmm. to get along mm -hmm. and it's very interesting stuff yeah. yeah it's interesting how much captivity changes wild behaviors and you know it's it's all different so since we're on this topic real quick, I'm going to, I'm going to pick your guys' brains again since I've, I've got like a captive audience. Uh, have any of you kept snakes outside in cages? I'm kind of thinking about doing a bunch of uh, outdoor rainbow ball cages uh, and blood python cages. So I've kind of got an idea down. I think I'm going to move them out in the spring and then just leave them out year, like probably all the way until fall, monitoring the temperatures. I've got some decent ideas of how I can do that and then uh, bring them in in the winter and then that's when I would breed them that's when I would get uh, hopefully babies and all that stuff and then move them back outside so I mean I think being outdoors you know I think like like you were saying Mariah earlier like light cycle and everything it's great we can replicate it mm -hmm. like technology there but nothing's gonna beat the sun you know like so that's kind of what that's that's kind of where I'm at like that's what I'm thinking about uh, starting to do so I don't know have, have you anyone had any experience with that uh, there's a, where do you live again? Remind me what state? I'm in North Carolina. So okay, I'm kind of up in the mountain. That area. Yeah. So it's, it's temperate for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, the I biggest thing is. Have, I don't think you'll have any big issues with like UV. I definitely want to measure, you know, find the area that you want to turn into an outdoor snake enclosure and then get UV readings with a solar, mo solar meter 6.5, um, figure out 
maximum and minimum temperature over the course mm -hmm. of a day and then compensate accordingly because just because it's outside doesn't mean it's perfect, obviously. Right. Um, it's, it's still a different climate from what they're native to. So you're still going to have to help it along a bit. Thermostats yeah. will probably be your best friend. Oh yeah, I've got those uh, sensor pushes that signal to your phone. And I mean, the reason I talk about this, do any of you know the old herp herpticulturist, Bert Langerwerf? He was dead a couple of years back, but um, no. he had a huge farm, Agu Agama International in Alabama. And he specifically bought this farm because he knew what organisms he wanted to work with and the latitudinal line of where Alabama was matched up perfectly with the animals that he wanted. So he picked animals specifically to that like uh, temperature and climate, not North American, but like Timon and Shinosaurus and like all of these organisms all around the world, you know, like, um, and, and he kept them, tegus, you know, this is, this is the 90s, early 2000s. So, and he was keeping all this stuff outside, Karushia. Um, but, and just tons of success. And I've never really kept heard of any big snake breeders keeping snakes outside. And I'm very curious, you know, at least for part of the year, I'm very curious if that would raise fecundity or lower it, or if it would stress them out, or if it would stimulate them. I don't know. I'm, I'm excited to try it, I guess. I don't if you do it right, it probably won't do. Like, even if you do it a little bit wrong, it would probably still be beneficial for the animal. Yeah. Yeah, even acute stress is enrichment sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. I don't, I don't uh, know of anyone breeding, but I do know, um, you know, folks that you can see online readily, Kenan at Camp Kenan and uh, Tom Crotchfield, who have their giant oh, yeah. snakes outside, yeah. um, which is a little Crotchfield. different situation. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah. Some very old school thinking and, and um, uh, just really just these massive snakes and massive enclosures. And uh, I think they're both down in Florida. Yeah, but yeah. Um, lucky Floridians. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, there's at least one benefit to Florida. And <laughs> the uh, let me ask you guys this: so uh, on the discussion of talking about building massive enclosures and three acres and indoor outdoor places and UV, um, the reptile hobby can be kind of expensive. So what do you guys think about? I, I always debate this question on should we promote massive PVC cages that are, you know, six feet by two feet for a four foot snake um, and, you know, UV, floodlights, bioactive. Uh, I mean, I'm in a very small collection here in, in my guest room slash snake room and I've got at least a thousand dollars worth of technology, let alone animals and, and, and enclosures. And it kind of makes me uh, ask the question, you know, is this a barrier to entry? Is this something that we need to sort of curb and, and focus on DIY and simplicity as much? Or do we take the other route and say, yeah, it's a barrier to entry and it keeps people who are gonna mess up out by keeping it somewhat expensive. So I, I kind of wonder, and I walked that line because I think maybe both sides are true, but I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that and we'll, we'll start with you, Trace. So, I mean, I've been doing this for, since I was a kid and I've kept animals and as any, anything, you know, from the most expensive cages or not most expensive, of course, but like I have tons of animal plastic cages and bull file cages and Neodesha. Um, and I also have a lot of uh, Zilla products. I have like a bunch of little strode open terrariums and like, yeah, you know, you can pay all the money and get like the bells and the whistles and everything, but you can also, I've cut my own glass and glued together my own terrariums from glass that you can buy at, you know, uh, Lowe's and silicone and make jigs and stuff like that. So, and you know, I, I know that there's tons, of, there's a lot of people that keep um, really cool habitats and just Rubbermaid tubs that they modify. So it just requires, if you're not gonna spend the money, then you have to have the time and ingenuity to possibly make something that you can make for really cheap. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said, you know, there is an injury, there, there is uh, a cost to entry. And like, you know, unfortunately, when people are given something for free as a gift, they don't, they tend to not respect it as much as something, or that they can happen. They may not respect it as much as something they had to pine for and save their money and then like invest in the thermostat, invest in all of this other stuff. So there's workarounds, but um, Mariah, you said it well earlier like uh it's all it's the na naivety um so naive keepers might not be able to kind of do that safely so it might be better to spend the money so i don't know i, I guess i gotta go back and forth 
Imre, you had your hand up earlier. Sorry, I uh, jumped to Trace right there. No, it's fine. I understand you have a system going on here. I, I think... High tech. There you go. <laughs> I think there's really a happy medium. And like uh, Trace was getting at, th there seems to be a, a trade-off between expense and creativity. So you can spend all the money to get things pre-made. I can definitely speak from that experience. Uh, I am not the craftiest person. Uh, so I prefer to let other people do the work for me and then I'll do like the final put together. But that's a lot more expensive than if you can make your own background. If you know you have the ability to mix your own substrate to the correct proportions, if you have access to right plants, like there's totally many ways that if you get more creative and be resourceful about it, you can totally reduce the cost. And honestly, one of the biggest costs of keeping a reptile, in my opinion, it's simply just getting the freaking enclosure. Like these, like you were saying, like these, these PVC enclosures are not cheap. There's a good reason why they're not, uh, but there is that. But if you, you know, take some sealed lumber and build your own enclosure from it, hey, you just saved yourself literally hundreds of dollars. And that decreases the expense overall. Is reptile keeping cheap? New. No. <laughs> I don't think it should be. Uh, the cost obviously goes up for certain species. Uh, for example, it seems that the ones that require more UV, more humidity are going to be more expensive simply because they need more equipment than the ones that live in smaller enclosures that temperatures that are closer to room temperature, not as much UV. So there's a, a a gradient, and I think the ones that are less demanding usually make better uh, entry-level pets for people who want to get into reptiles but aren't quite ready for the fanatical investment that tends to happen later on. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would like to see fewer people assuming that these are cheap pets that you can just get on a whim and it's just a reptile, so who cares if it dies? Like, it doesn't deserve like a zoo level exhibit just because it's a lizard or just because it's a snake. It's like, no, this is a living creature. We got to respect them as such. And if you're looking for a cheap pet, you probably shouldn't have a pet at all. So that's where I have to stand on that matter. There's definitely ways that you can reduce the cost of entry, but at the end of the day, if you're looking to cheap out on it, that's probably not the hobby for you. Heck, all hobbies are our total money wasters, let's be honest here. <laughs> Hobby is a fun way to spend your money. Yeah, that's a good point. What, do you, uh, what would you say, Riley? Yeah, I, I'm not opposed to having some barriers to entry in something that ultimately has implications for the health and well-being of an animal. So yeah, even a, a free shelter cat or a free shelter dog is going to cost you money in vaccinations, vet bills, toys, food, you know, care, all these things. So if, if you approach any pet looking for the cheap way to go, yeah, that's not a good start. But there are ways to, you know, cut some corners. So you can, instead of going crazy and getting like a big, super expensive retail enclosure, you could get a big tub and get the specialty enclosure designs, you know, conversion kit to make a slide opening. And you can do things where you can cut corners in ways that it does not um, compromise the animal's well-being. You can use alternative materials if they're safe and effective and contain the animal and all these ways to do it. But at the end of the day, like there are certain things you just shouldn't compromise on. Um, in my opinion, thermostats and, and your heating elements and how you monitor those systems, no compromise. The more you pay, the more you get out of it and you, you go cheap, you get cheap. So in some things, what you put in is what you get out. But um, that being said, sometimes, you know, you start somewhere and you just do a tub under your bed with a heat pad, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like you can do it that way too, as long as you know what you're doing, because you can do it wrong and it can cost you, you know, the life of an animal or multiple if you don't. Um, and then the only other comment I have on that is it's really silly when people, people complain about the expensive things um, in the reptile hobby when 
look at the fish people that sp you know spend thousands of dollars on pumps and aquariums and all this stuff for like a twenty dollar fish like it's the exact opposite and they don't have any qualms about it thousands of dollars for life support systems and sumps and backups and lights and and everything to have a couple fish and they're not even going to breed and make money off of them in the back end because they just want this to to do well and they and that's what it takes for those fish to survive and thrive and and i just it's a really uh it's a complete opposite um perspective in the reptile hobby yeah that's, that's a good analogy i've not thought of that that's something too you mentioned that uh, that they're not even going to breed and, and profit off it on the back end because i think in i'm the same way you know i have uh, a pair of rainbow bows so i say you know two years down the line i'm gonna pair them up and sell those babies uh and it's i think that's such a unique uh I'm, i've seen people do it with dogs which we're not going to get into the eight million strays <laughs> that are on the street right now um but you know it's it's not it's a unique hobby um and i, I think it can be dangerous to see that sometimes too, you know, someone just has enough space. They don't even tell, you know, they're 15 and they don't even tell their parents that they have two ball pythons living under their bed and then uh, they have eggs and then they have 10 ball pythons. And, you know, yeah. it's like, it's, it's a, a unique um, sort of dynamic. So um, interesting. Thank you guys. A lot of good info on that. Let me ask you guys this question. So this was one that uh, Lori asked on Facebook earlier. And bear with me because I, I want to read it out through here. Um, and, and like I mentioned earlier, she gets a lot of attention for her work on training snakes. So if you haven't seen Lori Tarina's YouTube channel, it's, it's actually really informative. I think it's one of the hidden gems on, on the internet. And she asked me a question, said the basic five freedoms and five opportunities to thrive are rarely mentioned in herpetoculture and as welfare science informs us, if these were being adhered to, advancing husbandry, which is what we're talking about here, would naturally fall into a place. So why are these standards of welfare absent so much of reptile keeping? And for those that, that aren't familiar with them, the because the, I hadn't known exactly what they were until she asked me the question, uh, which proves her point. Those five freedoms are freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury, or disease, freedom to express normal behavior, and the freedom from fear and distress. And so those five opportunities to thrive are the opportunity for a well-balanced diet, opportunity to self-maintain, opportunity for optimal health, opportunity to express species-specific behavior, and the opportunity for choice and control. So I know that's a lot there. Um, I know for me, this was honestly the first time I had heard them. Um, but what do you guys think? Should we codify and enforce reptile keeping? Should there be more concrete guidelines and since Mariah, since I think it's kind of your purview with reptophiles, why don't we start with you? Okay. So again, uh, this is something I've addressed before with reptophiles. Um, we had a collaborative effort around the new year with, uh, let's see, Custom Reptile Habitats and the Animals at Home podcast to do a series of, I think it came out to four articles, all revolving around the concept of the uh, five uh, freedoms of animal welfare. And it was a very interesting experience. And I came away from it thinking that really this should be how we approach animal husbandry in general. It's okay. Can we tick off the boxes? I'm a total checklist person. So having an itemized list of five things, five goals is great for me, uh, especially as I create care guys and work to find the best information on reptile husbandry it really is okay here's the standard are we meeting the standard and regardless of what species you are working with this is universal which is kind of rare to find so let's see how we can meet that standard i love having it now is it enforceable <sighs> uh well europeans say yes americans say no from my experience um if we could enforce it perfectly, I'd be all for it. But the problem is when you get people making laws that have no idea what they're talking about, then you get some problems that occur. And a lot of the laws that I have seen in, in other countries about minimum standards of care are usually off the mark or not very helpful anyway. So I think it should be more of a common knowledge thing, just like you see a lot of groups they're like okay don't use red bulbs for heat uh don't 
use a heat pad without a thermostat. Like there are some things that we can generally agree on. And I think it would be really great to just make this mainstream so that we have a social pressure within the hobby, within the industry to adhere to these five rules to overall elevate reptile husbandry, if that makes sense. Good answer. What, what do you guys think, uh, Riley? I think, I think it's definitely something that we can incorporate into husbandry standards, whether it be, you know, so a lot of folks coming into the hobby look for care sheets or, you know, the, the first thing they can Google something like that. And, and if, you know, those, those care sheets or the sources of information that people tend to go to first sort of incorporated into that, uh, into their husbandry suggestions, as far as like enclosure furniture or appropriate lighting or, you know, preferred substrate that's species specific or, you know, things relating to, you know, whether the animal prefers to be out at day or, or night or how it does with foot traffic. Is it really shy species, things like that. We could really over time see a shift. I don't think it's necessarily something you could enforce. Um, but, you know, the, the wonderful thing with our, our country right now and probably the worst thing with our country now is everyone's plugged into their phones and social media. And so, you know, if it gets steam, it becomes a standard, then it almost, it's kind of sad that people behave this way. But if it's like, if, if you're not on board, you're not the cool kid or you're, you're like a, you're just seen as like not with it or something. It's like, if it were, I don't want to say trendy because trends come and go, but like if it became like mainstream in some fashion where these were the standards and it was just like all the examples you saw on YouTube hit this, all the, you know, Instagram, all the social media stuff. Like if everybody that was as, you know, plugged into that, plugged that into their standards, I think you could, you know, see gradual change and people like to police themselves anyway. So <laughs> Just, you know, we, we don't do it well on Facebook, so. Yeah, well said. Um, do you have anything to add on that, Trace? Uh, no, no, I think, I think they're um, very well stated standards. Uh, I've never, like, I guess when you hear them, um, like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But then when you actually think about it, it's like, well, yeah, you know, of course that's like what we all do, you know, like we don't not give our snakes water bowls, you know, so. So it's it's obvious, but it's it's very poignant. So um, yeah, I think I think so. There's um, and there's that level of um, sort of minimum expectations, and I feel like the five opportunities to thrive really sort of reach out to those next level. And yeah. then we have to ask ourselves, and I, I struggle with this question all the time, and I see people with YouTube videos, and they say not giving your snakes UVB is unethical, and I'm, I like, whoa, slow down a little bit. Is it? I don't know. It, it, I'm glad that someone has that opinion and is putting that out there. I don't know if I can agree that that's an unethical statement at this point. Um, but like one of the things too, that was one of the opportunities is to express species specific behavior and for a well-balanced diet. And I think that's something that doesn't get discussed enough. Um, what, what do you guys think about feeding? And we'll stay with you, Trace, um, feeding more than say, for instance, a ball python, feeding more than just African soft for rats. Oh yeah. Like I, I vary all my animals' diets tremendously. I think, uh, and that might be like from just uh, holdover from the zoo. You know, I think uh, nutrition and enrichment is really important. So, I feed a lot of frozen. I almost exclusively feed frozen thaw to all the adults, but even they, uh, they'll get guinea pigs, quail, chickens. Um, we'll do, you know, rats and mice, of course, uh, hamsters. I mean, as as much things as we can. We used to do a lot of like high quality fish, so like uh, whole trout and stuff like that. Even for like particularly like blackhead pythons, like those that, that, the aspidites is just they're so intelligent, you know, and they have such a high metabolism. So um, I'll feed out other reptiles. I know it's not a very popular, but as a breeder, you know, sometimes we get you know weird stillborns or stuff like that. So I have some king snakes, some Florida king snakes. One's named Rancor, and he's just like they'll eat you know anything that you offer. So they're kind of like mm -hmm. the trash bin. Um, I mean, it's enrichment, you know, nothing suffering, of course. And, uh, I guess, yeah. So I think the next step 
I love guinea pigs and I want to start raising, I want to get a little colony of guinea pigs to live with my tortoises also. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so like, I really want to start, you know, cause they're like, they don't exist in the wild. They're a fully domesticated right. organism, you know, like that's so cool to me, you know, like, uh, so I'd love to start raising a, a colony of guinea pigs. I think they'd get along well with the tortoises on the property. And then, uh, extra guinea pig meat is good for me. I rarely eat meat, so I could eat some cooey and, I could happily, you know, I'm sure the snakes would be happy about that. It, of course, all ethical and, you know, um, you know, euthanized properly and everything. But yeah, that's kind of, I'd like to do those in like more contortrix quails. So I like, I want to get away from uh, buying food and having it shipped and just raising my own food. So I'm even more, you know, you know, get back to that grassroots type, type situation. So Awesome. Yeah. And, and Mariah, you were telling us earlier about um, your, and I'm kind of just going to, jam through it so we can move on a little bit, but you were telling us how it, it's sticking with those five opportunities to thrive. You don't just turn on a light in the morning and then turn it off at night. They're on set timers. You have specific lights set up for bright noon light and it varies for your crepuscular versus your nocturnal. And then even the UVB isn't on right when the other lights turn on as well, because that's just, you know, UV light scatters at a when it comes in shallow through the atmosphere. So in mornings and evenings, animals don't get it um, the way that they do, you know, uh, in the in the midday when the sun's overhead. And Riley, you were mentioning it as well too. I point, I pointed to the screen so that everyone can see who I'm mm -hmm. talking to. Uh, Riley, you mentioned it as well too, you know, just a little extra opportunity to live naturally when you when you cohab certain animals. And then when you talked about obviously what they do at the zoo. And and I think that's some stuff that we can really start thinking on. Um, one thing that drives me, I mean, as many reptile groups as I think someone can be in uh, on Facebook, and I don't comment on all of them, but I, I cause I don't, I don't know much about a lot of animals. Um, but I, I uh, one thing that drives me absolutely insane is just as soon as someone has a, an idea, can I do this? Um, I'm doing this and it's working out great. And everyone's like, no, that's the worst idea. No, you know, just there's this, these absolute lines. And I think um, if we're asking ourselves, you know, what's the best we can do, we have to push a little bit of boundaries. So I'm, I'm glad we got a chance to talk about that. Lastly, I want to discuss um, something that I feel like is really, it's, it's always been in the hobby, but is really becoming a lot more mainstream. And that's just bioactive enclosures. And what it what is it so i don't know if, if that's worth um talking about at this time but we all know what it is but what how is that good for our animals is it good for our animals what's what's up with bioactive uh and we'll we'll stick with you uh riley if you could speak to that and then we'll we'll, we'll hear from everyone so i'll i'll freely admit that i am new to the whole learning the bioactive scene um I kind of have like an understanding and the gist of it, you know, you're essentially creating uh, live soil, live ecosystem for your animals with a balance of like cleanup crew plants and, and there's a plenty of documented benefits. Um, and, you know, again, being species specific, it can be really helpful. Uh, I've, I've set up enclosures in zoos that sort of became established with live plants long enough where they turned into bioactive, namely like, dark frog enclosures, um, different, uh, you know, tropical animals, just springtails found their way in, some Australian frogs, things like that. And so it's sort of, it, I can see the benefit with the cleanup crew and they can generate some extra humidity and things. And so I can see it being beneficial and, and, and you know, probably harmless to a lot of species. But, um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Like if I were to do that, I, I think it would just be a lot more work. And I know some twitchy animals that probably would be annoyed with having bugs crawling all over them. And you know, if you're talking about doing it with some small in, invertebrates like tarantulas, your cleanup crew is going to get eaten. So I don't think it works in every scenario. And I also think if you really wanted to have like something that can handle the waste load of a species, like say a blood Python, it's just not going to work. Um, but otherwise I don't know enough about it to like, you know, be all that fancy with it, but I do see it being popular these days. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that as an initiative for new keepers coming in thinking that I should do bioactive. Cause to me, that says from right out of the gate, they want to go above and beyond and set something up and really go into every facet of 
husbandry from plants to lighting to all these things. And so if that's where they're starting off, I think, you know, kudos to that. I don't see anything wrong with that being uh, a part of the, the reptile keeping hobby. But for me, um, you know, it doesn't seem practical on the scale of animals I keep and certain species, but otherwise I think it's awesome. Okay, great. Uh, Mariah, what would you, what would you say on the topic? First, there are a lot of misconceptions about bioactive. Um, I definitely am still relatively new to it. Um, I, roughly half of my enclosures are bioactive and uh, some of them are enclosures I haven't converted but will. Uh, some of them are enclosures that I did convert and am questioning having converted and others are enclosures that I haven't converted and probably never will. Um, there, a lot of people think that bioactive and naturalistic are the same thing, but the thing is they're not. Naturalistic simply means that you are seeking to recreate the animal's habitat for its own benefit, not simply because you want something pretty to display in your living room. There's a big difference. You can have something uh, that looks nice and natural when it's actually not natural at all for the animal and they can't use it the way that they're meant to use. Uh, their territory. Uh, bioactive is simply taking naturalistic, taking that slice of nature and making it functional on a biological level. Um, so for example, you can't really do a true bioactive with fake plants. I tried. It's very hard to keep stable. Um, granted, that's only one case. <laughs> you need more, but live plants play a big role in soil health and in regulating humidity and oxygen levels and keeping away the bad bacteria and fungi and encouraging the good ones. Uh, you have, you know, your cleanup crew, but you don't just have isopods and springtails in nature. You have a variety of cleanup crew bugs that all play a role. Also, do you have the beneficial fungi and bacteria in the soil? Um, a lot of people don't take that into consideration. They're just like, put some dirt in it, put some plants in it, put some, put a reptile in it and you're good. And I was like, no, you need to seed it with the right germs, so to speak, uh, to make it functional on a microbiology level. Uh, so there's a lot of work that goes into it. And ov obviously the lighting and everything else, it's complicated to recreate nature, not just in appearance, but also in function. Um, so it's doable. I think it's great. Um, for me, since I have a growing collection, it is very nice to not have to worry so much about having to totally strip an enclosure and replace what is often, you know, a hundred pounds of substrate or more and keep things a little bit more stable, keep things less stressful from me having just always being in my reptile space. Like for example, my morning geckos, <laughs> yeah, if I had to strip that if once a quarter, that would be nearly impossible. I'd be losing geckos left and right. I have that bioactive for a reason, and it's so I can keep them safely, uh, <laughs> keep them safely self-maintaining, more or less, with maintenance. Uh, but, you know, for my snakes, uh, waste load is totally a thing. And on the one hand, it's tempting to go bioactive because they like to poo where I can't see it. And so I really have to go on a hunt, the lamest Easter egg hunt ever. Mm. And so it's like, oh, gee, it'd be nice if a cleanup crew could handle this. But the thing is, snakes have big poo. And usually crew can't handle it. And even in, you know, your average bioactive enclosure, a lot of people think that bioactive means no maintenance. That's totally false. Bioactive just has a different set of maintenance. You are still removing contaminated substrate. You are still removing feces. You are still removing urate. Like you might put it, like leave a little bit in for your cleanup crew, if your cleanup crew can handle it. But say you've got like a Burmese python, a retic, a tegu, uh, a Nile monitor, like, are you kidding me? No, you have to do something uh, to help maintain hygiene. Uh, hygiene and bioactive don't necessarily go hand in hand, uh, so you have to be very careful about that. And then there's plant maintenance, and the list goes on and on. So you really have to know what you're doing when you get into bioactive. So naturalistic, I think, is a really great first step in that direction, what we should be uh, promoting. 
more is let's focus on recreating the animal's natural habitat first. If you want to take the step into bioactive, here are the resources. It's an additional investment. It could be awesome, but you're not necessarily doing less work. Well said. Yeah, excellent. Trace, would you like to add anything on the topic? Yeah, Mariah, I would agree. Like, it's, it's definitely a different set of, of work, different set of husbandry. Uh, I'm super pumped about bioactive. I think it's like the next wave of herpticulture. Um, I think it's uh, more enriching for the animals. I think it's better for their gut biome. I think it's better for the entire habitat. And I can relate that, um, you know, directly working in the amphibian conservation area, which is a very large uh, building at the zoo that was closed to the public where we'd reproduce uh, uh, frogs and hellbenders and all kinds of salamanders and stuff for re-release into the wild and for assurance programs. Uh, we had Peltofriny lemur, the Puerto Rican crested toads. Uh, we've released like thousands of tadpoles a year down in Puerto Rico. Um, very early on, we were keeping these on like mats, uh, like very like basic, you know, very basic, like, you know, 20 gallon tank with a plastic mat and a little pool of water. And then they, the keeper would pull the plastic mat out every day and bleach it. And these Peltofriny, they had so many issues with, um, you know, they would get like uh, infections and stuff like that. And it was just because they didn't have like the proper bacteria and stuff to help break down. I mean, even though they were getting cleaned all the time, there is a level where you can keep things too clean and too sanitary to an extent. You want to have like kind of a balance going on. Once we move them over to like, uh, like I think Riley, Riley said earlier, like the, a dart frog more set up where you have tons of uh, substrate and you have drainage levels and you have plants and things like that. Uh, yeah, it does, you know, I, I don't know if it's just because they're not exposed to their waste and their nit nitrogen buildup uh, causes issues or if it's more sh like less stressful. Uh, so their immune system is boosted. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a thousand different things, but husbandry wise, I think, I think that's, that's like the next step. And I really think like, you know, if you think about reef keeping, um, there are just a few, they're like a generation ahead of herpticulture. And reef keepers all have, you know, like look at all the hermit crabs and all the, you know, you can buy whole cleanup crews and stuff like that to dump into your reef tank and even a lot of your uh, marine fish tanks. And so if we look at them, like they're just, oh, they're just a couple steps ahead of us and like kind of model herpticulture after the things they're doing. Um, I, I think that's the best thing to do. The only thing that I will say as a uh, uh, Department of Agriculture uh, entomologist is isopods are awesome. I love isopods, um, <laughs> but like they can, there are some potential invasive species. And so right now isopods are not insects, they're crustaceans. And so they're kind of flying under the radar of permitting. We're aware of them We're we don't want to pass permits on them, but like as soon as some like soybean farmer calls the USDA and is like, there's all these roly polies eating all my soybean. It's like, okay, that's over. Like we're, these are now all banned. Just like, you know, all the exotic beetles and cool walking sticks and, you know, uh, all of these awesome insects that you see, you know, giant African snails that you see people keep as pets in other countries. Uh, the agriculture here in the United States is such a huge industry. There's no way you can ever, um, they're not gonna, bend over backwards for you know roly-poly keepers unfortunately yeah. as much as I <laughs> argue so we do have to be very careful of the environment we are you know these these cleanup crews like people I I, I know it's happening you know um, they're dumping substrate outside full of exotic isopods luckily these isopods don't have wings they're not migrating far and they probably wouldn't survive the winters here that's still an invasive species or could has the potential to be invasive species and um, mm. that could bring a lot of weird laws so like freezer substrate or don't mm -hmm. dump it outside. I hate this. I, you know, I, I, you know, people probably don't want to hear, you know, they're, that they should kill all of the microorganisms and isopods that they enjoy keeping every time they strip their cage, but don't dump it outside, like be responsible and, and freeze even that stuff. Um, and I, it sucks. I have a huge chest freezer. I have to freeze dirt all the time. So, uh, cause I, yeah, I've got some cool isopods too, but, and I don't want them to become regulated or quarantine significant. So. That's a really good point. Biosecurity is another thing that's flying under the radar with uh, the surge of popularity with bioactive keeping. Yes. A lot of people, and frankly, myself, up to very recently, I was like, yeah, take a log out from the wild and it's nothing but beneficial microorganisms. <laughs> I'm just going to stick it into my enclosure. And it's like, no, <laughs> there are lots of things that can potentially harm my reptile. There's lots of things that could potentially uh, cause an imbalance in the ecosystem I'm trying to create. And 
I love that you mentioned outbound biosecurity as well, not just the inbound, but the outbound. Like we need to be thinking about what are we doing to our local ecosystems? And I love that idea. Like just as, you know, people are, the better keepers are in the habit of sterilizing substrate before they put it into their enclosures because they're worried about mites. It's okay, let's sterilize the substrate after we've used it. Like it's one thing if it's not bioactive. It's another thing when it is and it's got all the bugs and the bacteria and the fungi and all of that in it. You don't want to be exposing your local ecosystem to something because then again, you know, not only damaging local environment, but you could also be causing harm to farmers. I grew up in the Minnesota, North Dakota area. Uh, farmers are near and dear to my heart. Um, and we don't want more restrictive laws than we already have. Yeah, very well said. And that, that reminds me, when I worked at Santa Barbara, we had an APHIS permit even for the zoo just to have um, certain insects uh, and invertebrates in our collection. And namely the, uh, the giant cave roaches and Madagascar hissing cockroaches and uh, African giant millipedes. Anytime we did substrate changes, we would uh, dump all the substrate or uh, exoskeletons separately into bags and freeze them in an ultra low at like negative 72 degrees centi or Celsius and uh, just like freezing the bejesus out of this stuff for 72 hours and then it could go off to a company that would then in a controlled setting incinerate it so it would not have any chance of getting out. And and it's, it's really funny because at reptile shows, even in California, you can just buy hissing cockroaches and millipedes. And I guarantee you people are just ditching all the substrate. And if you ever get millipedes and they breed, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of eggs and babies that get out and you never know what you're going to do. And so, yeah, that's, that's not even talked about in the hobby sector really. Um, and it's, it's a scary thing. So, you know, for me personally, like at one point, uh, we had a, a hissing cockroach and, and I think I still have uh, dirt frozen in my freezer just because like mm -hmm. even just at home for that one roach, that's, you know, better safe than sorry. And it's just good practice all around. And yeah, we got to think about the final steps as well. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that SOP. But yeah, that's, that's who I work for. So that's that's cool. Yeah. To hear. I, and I will say just, oh, I'm sorry. I will say since we are on video, uh, I think that they, APHIS and uh, Plant Protection Quarantine has written 30 uh, species of cockroaches that are so common in the pet trade and, and uh, that you no longer need permits for. So oh, uh, nice. and mostly because people, just so many people had like Madagascar and cockroaches and dubia, they, they no longer require any type of quarantine significant permits. Now other, other species of cockroaches, other species of you know insects and stuff uh do and even you guys are in california there's a invasive species of uh indian walking stick carousel mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. there it's like there's no males or parthenogenic they just they just squirt out eggs just call, they're just little mm -hmm. egg ma makers so great chameleon food so if you can get a colony of those <laughs> they're they're there yeah. you know but um that's great uh fascinating stuff on a lot of and I think uh, one of the funny things that won't show up in the YouTube video because it just highlights the speaker when a lot of us were speaking well, a lot of you guys were speaking um, I noticed that the other participants were always thrown out like so I just, want, <laughs> I, I just wanted to say that for the recording that, that there was a lot of positive re reaffirmation even though it didn't come through verbally so right now I'm going to jump into a lightning round questions and then after that we'll do audience questions we had one on Facebook that I'll throw in this one's it's it starts off as a little bit of a serious, uh, you know, regular question, and then they move on from there into other territory. Um, but, so we'll start with Trace, and then this one will be for everyone. Where would you like to see advancements in hus husbandry, and what can the average keeper do better? So this is lightning round. So just what would you say off the top of your head? Oh, uh, I guess bioactive, <laughs> just because it's fresh on my brain. So I think that's I think that's fascinating. Enrichment and bioactive substrates and uh, more naturalistic enclosures, like Mariah said. I think that you know going the more European style of keeping and, you know, kind of gearing it towards like marine keepers, stuff like that, like I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, nothing fresh, sad stuff I've already said, so cool. since it's lighting around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Keep it quick. Uh, Mariah, how about you? Gosh, okay. If I had to pick one, uh, more space. I think space. larger enclosures, generally speaking, is going to almost always be a better investment. Uh, as Americans, we tend to keep things on the small side. I, I would especially like to see 
uh, more focus on larger enclosures for snakes. And on that note, more focus on height in enclosures. Everyone thinks, oh, my reptile, my skink climbs six inches. It's arboreal, ha ha ha. It's like, no. Most, anim most terrestrial animals can climb. Most fossorial animals can climb to a certain extent. Give them the opportunity to climb. They will get more exercise that way. They will get more enrichment out of their environments. And overall, the enclosure becomes more functional and you can just do much more with it when, it, when you expand its dimensions. Awesome, yeah, we, uh, for keen observers, they can see your ball python at the top of its branch there behind you. Um, yep, right there. Excellent, Riley, how about you? What, uh, what would you like to see moving forward and what can keepers do better? Uh, quarantine and just better protocol overall. Um, everyone who does uh, an unboxing video in their snake room, you get an F, and I'm sorry, you've failed uh, incredibly. Um, quarantine, 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 wash your hands, different set of tools, keep it, you know, close to sterile for a while so you can observe, you know, take it to different degrees if you're dealing with an import versus Captain Born and Bred. Anybody who gets a snake from me or anything, if they ask, should I quarantine it? I say, yes, absolutely. I encourage it. I encourage everyone to quarantine. I quarantine things that come from people that I know are trusted resources that have a more or less closed collection and it doesn't offend them that I quarantine them because it's just good practice. Um, and, and I think um, people have heard the word quarantine and I don't think they truly understand what it means. So I think people really need to go research what true, true quarantine is and then find ways to you know, enact that procedurally as far as their day-to-day -day in and out of, of collections. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Mariah, what's your favorite city in the world? My favorite city? Yeah. Gosh, uh, I've been to a few places. I've been blessed enough to be able to travel. Um, of all the places I've been, this is lightning round? That's not fair. This is lightning. Yeah, you got to go uh, real quick. First, there's a city already in your head and you just have to say it. London. Perfect. That is the correct answer for you. Riley, what, <laughs> what's the worst injury you've ever had? Oh, dude. I, uh, I broke my ankle skateboarding and, and chipped the, the, the bone that's like right on the, your core ankle bone. I chipped the very tip of that off and it floated uh, forward into my foot. Um, and then my foot swelled up the size of a grapefruit. So that was, that was a bad one. Sick, dude. Uh, <laughs> uh, Trace, what's your favorite vegetable? Uh, Brussels sprouts. Ooh, good choice. Okay. Mariah, scariest animal or natural encounter? The one that I've actually had? Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> anytime I see a spider without expecting it. <laughs> That's a good answer. Uh, Riley, worst movie that you've seen more than twice? Oh, these are hard. <laughs> Frozen. <laughs> uh, good. Uh, Trace, this one's not hard. Dogs or cats? Uh, cats. Mariah, dramas or comedies? It really depends on the drama and the comedy. If I had to pick, probably a comedy. Comedies. Uh, Riley, do you sing to your animals? No. <laughs> You're missing out. Trace, uh, <laughs> coral, is it a plant or an animal? It's an animal. Uh, and then last one, this would be for everyone. Mariah, only allowed to keep one reptile for the rest of your life. What is it? Only one species, only one subspecies. Only one animal. One animal. Blue tongue skink. Awesome. I think they're uh, great. Riley, how about you? One animal? Mm hmm Probably a Komodo dragon. Okay. <laughs> uh, great. Trace? Uh, Bipes biporus, those little uh, little worm lizards with the front legs, the fossorial live underground. Oh, they're those pink. are amazing. So freaking cute, man. I just, they're like Baja, Calif or Baja uh, California, part of Mexico is 
you can't get a lot out of Mexico. So, but man, I, I want one. <laughs> That's <laughs> would, cool. Yeah, they're neat. Terrific. Thank you, guys. Um, I do have an audience question from Carol for Trace, um, and you can probably see it here in the chat. She's never been able to locate Taurus mites in the U.S., the predatory mites that eat snake mites. Yeah. Um, is this a permitting issue, or am I just missing them? Uh, I think you're just missing them, because there are quite a few predatory mites, uh, specifically for agriculture and greenhouse. Uh, you have to be very careful, because some are very uh, host-specific, so they'll go after, um, oh, I okay. can't, uh, hypoaspis miles, I know, I think they might have changed the uh, taxonomy on that, but there's like less host specific mites. Some mites will only eat other like two spotted, you know, mites and um, the Taurus mites. I think that they're common in Europe. I want to say the uh, company koppert.com, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's something like that. Uh, I'd have to look it up. Uh, they sell a large variety of um, different types of predatory mites. And you just have to kind of do some research and dig and find a mite species that can feed on all kinds of um, greenhouse pests. And honestly, a lot of these um, uh, green companies and these like integrated pest management companies, if you email them, they have entomologists on staff. And if you tell them like, hey, I'm gonna release these in a, in a habitat, you know, that's basically equivalent to a greenhouse and I want them to eat uh, springtails and you know forward fly larva and snake mites and I want to, I want a generalist predatory mite. Uh, those entomologists on staff might be able to help you or point you in the right direction. So I've I've had some luck with that. It's really neat. What happens to the snake mites or the snake mite to the predatory mites? Do you just end up with a predatory mite infestation after they? No, I mean like so mites. I mean this micro world is they're. I mean this is like yeah the micro world is very similar to our macro world. So if you release a bunch of lions into a wildebeest, you know, habitat, they'll eat all the wildebeest and then they'll all starve. So, however, with the predatory mites, um, a lot of these that have very wide host ranges, they'll just always find things to eat. You know, there's always gonna be, the populations will just kind of level out, like, you know, one lion to every 60 wildebeest or 600 wildebeest or whatever that, you know, uh, dynamic is. So mm. it'll, it'll just level out and you'll have a constant you know, population of predatory mites. And this is particularly good probably for someone like, uh, like, you know, a breeder, someone that has a lot of habitat. So the mites can kind of migrate and go into different racks and just kind of clear everything out. So, um, and then if you clean an entire enclosure, you're still going to have mites that are eventually going to migrate back in. But um, yeah, so, but it's not a quick fix to snake mites. If you have snake mites, um, this is more of a preventative to ever, they'll kill the snake mites before the snake mites become established. If you have a bad snake mite infestation, the best thing to do is probably treat with chemicals or uh, mechanical, just changing that uh, substrate all the time, newspaper, cleaning it, you know, using permethrin, stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. um, and then eventually adding in uh, predatory mites. Terrific, thanks, Trace. Um, and so this one's open to everyone, and I'll, I'll think I'll start with this one. All uh, from Lori Trini. All of you are committed to progressing herpticulture and progressing care. What have you found to be an effective way to reach those people within the culture who are closed-minded and/or who oppose change, even when it is supported by science? Um, that's a terrific question. I, I find, and this is not with, uh, with pretty much with anything in general when you're trying to change someone's mind. For me, I like to just ask them questions and, and hope to guide them to the right uh, solution themselves because otherwise I end up arguing, and I've done plenty of arguing on, uh, on online as well, which is, it's, it's harmful to, because no one, you don't change anyone's mind. So I've tried to, to always ask questions, but what, do you, what would you guys find? I'll open up to, to anyone who'd like to take that on. How would you change someone's mind? I don't, I don't think you can, but. <laughs> yeah. The, the correct answer is watch herpetological panel forums on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, like and subscribe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but uh, Mariah, you had your hand up. So what, what were you thinking? Uh, yeah, I agree with Riley. Uh, when there is somebody who's dead set on not believing science and, and all the evidence that you put in front of them, at the end of the day, you can't change their mind and you just kind of have to give up on them and move on and hope that, you know, they're, they're in the minority. Uh, for me, uh, I try to focus on leading by example. 
Uh, I have put, I have significantly invested in the last year in upgrading my reptile enclosures. Uh, most of the income that I have received from reptophiles has simply gone into upgrading my reptile enclosures so that I can be a better example and use my enclosures, not just as, you know, my pet's habitats, but conversation starting examples for people to use. And I find that when you show that positivity is generally more effective than negativity. And when you show positivity and you show that a, a different way that is working, it starts to get people's curiosity. Yeah, yeah very true. Uh, Trace, any thoughts on that? Uh, no, because I was, I was answering Carol's uh, That's okay. message about the, <laughs> about the mites, so uh, I didn't get to formulate one. K-O-P-P-E-R-T-U-S dot com was, yeah. was the link you said. Um, and Carol, thanks to you. Uh, Tara also asks, are there other ways to kill off any insects and bioactive substrate other than freezing? Or is that the only way to verify nothing gets out in the environment? Burn it. Yeah, um, yeah, burn it. Uh, you know, at the zoo, we did deep freeze like you did, Riley. We also did autoclaves. Not everyone has mm -hmm. autoclaves. Uh, but, you know, just drying it out too, if you just dry the substrate out. but uh maybe ziploc bagging it and letting it sit for a very long time Ox oxygen deprivation mm -hmm. but i think freezing is honestly like probably going to be the easiest to do well i think um and the reason why uh, i would imagine tara's asking probably the same reason that i'm asking is if i uh, empty an entire tub of substrate into uh, my freezer i wouldn't have any more room for uh, amy's yeah. organic lasagna yeah. uh, so <laughs> bonfire <laughs> Time to burn yeah. some dirt, I guess. Okay. Burn some yeah, soil. that's my question. Does dirt burn? Like, I didn't yeah. think dirt burned. Like, leaves, yeah, but dirt? Yeah, it'll burn. Uh, yeah, it'll burn. Oh, all at right. least all the microorganisms in it will. They, right. they won't like fair. that very much. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, fair. In, in like a contained high heat source that you're, you're generating like that, and it's, you know, mostly organic material, it's, it's going to eventually combust. So, yeah. yeah. Fair point. It's you all guys, organic. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for those who attended and, and especially those of you who stayed through all the way through to the end. Um, what a fantastic contribution from all three of you guys. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm stoked to, uh, uh, to be able to get to chat with you guys. So uh, it, it was a, an honor and a privilege to meet all of you guys. And um, thank you very much. If, if there's anything else you'd like to add, otherwise we'll say goodnight. Yeah, thank you all. It was, it was very enjoyable. Um, and then Tara did want to mention, uh, I think she bought a BRB, a Brazilian rainbow boa from you. And she said, your oh. information on caring for neonates was great. Um, yeah, it's done amazingly well and is now two years of age. Just wanted to give that positive feedback. Yeah, I thought I recognized Tara Lafferty. Uh, my partner typically does a lot of the email answering and uh, customer service. So uh, she would have, and she's smarter than me, so she would have definitely <laughs> recognized the name. But uh, great to hear that that little guy's doing well for you. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys. It was uh, really fun. So I uh, appreciate you guys staying with me. Have a great night, everyone. Right, bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was a lot of great information. There's going to be so much more I want to dive into. I want to dive into each and every one of those topics and do a deep dive on bioactive, lighting, UVB, uh, recreating the day and night cycles, uh, nutrition, right? Reptile diet is so super important. So there's so much more and hopefully we'll probably see some of those panelists again in the future on some more in-depth topics that we covered here. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you made it this far, again, like, share, and subscribe. Subscribe to this channel, guys. It goes a long way to, to help out what we're doing here. And I hope you enjoyed learning something. See you next time.